Anyway, um, first of all, just welcome. For those who don't know, uh, my name is Mary Waldron. I am the interim president of the Downtown Brockton Association. I'm also the executive director of the Old Colony Planning Council. We are property owners at 70 School Street at the corner of Montello and School. Um, I want to say maybe perhaps we're ground zero in many ways, but I love the city that I live in. I love the city that I work in. So some ground rules. Um, bathrooms. Men rooms are on this side. Ladies room, you go out that back door to the left. Um, again, we're going to have some rules in front of the audience, but for all of us, the rules are going to be respect. Respect for the positions you are in, respect for the diversity that we have here today, respect for the differences of opinions. I will not, this meeting will be shut down in a quick second if there is any disrespect um, and not following the rules. It's really important. Um, I am a Brockton resident. I am not a native of Brockton. I married a guy <laughs> from Brockton and um, have a beautiful daughter who's married and owns a home here in Brockton. Um, that in itself provides me so much pride about the work that we do. Um, I have been honored to be working over the last several months with the mayor, Councillor Thompson, and many of the other councillors and state legislators and stakeholders. Um, it's a very sensitive and very vital issue for many, but homelessness is increasing. Mental health is increasing. Substance use is increasing. And I will dare anyone in this room to not have been affected by this. I have family members and or friends who have either lost members to these different illnesses. But we need to come together and have conversation and have, more importantly, action items. Um, there will be more to be talked about. But again, I want to, I need to first thank my staff. Um, the Downtown Brockton Association does not have any income that, or persons working for us. Um, I beg them, but no, but they actually, they willingly are here. So between Megan Fortier and Elise Prince, who put together, thank you. I also want to be able to thank um, Brockton Public Library. Um, being here, this is a perfect location. It would have never fit into my office. This would never have happened. And again, um, for all of you who are here um, as stakeholders and who are also as interested um, folks. So I'd like to turn this over to Mayor Sullivan. Um, I'm going to pass this mic. Thank you, Mary. Um, well, first of all, good evening and, and welcome here. And I want to thank Mr. Paul Engel, the director of the library, for hosting us tonight, his team. Um, there's a lot of folks here tonight, and that speaks lines to Brockton, right? I mean, you could be anywhere on a Wednesday night, and you hear at the Lingo's Auditorium. I want to thank Councilor Thompson. I want to thank Mary Waldman. I see Senator Mike Grady joining us as well. Um, at the end of the day, what we need to do is we need to work together in collaboration, um, but we need to come up to try to solve problems together. Um, I've said this many, many, many times, and I'll continue to say it, being mayor and, and not being mayor, we're in the people business, and right now, we have to help the homeless population and those being impacted and affected by drugs and alcohol and mental health issues. With that being said, I, I'm joined today by Chief Brenda Perez, Chief Brian Nadelli, Pat Hill at DPW, Commissioner Tim Carpenter, I'm Jasmine Brash here from my office, who's the Social Service Director, and John Messia, who's our Director of Constituent Services. I can tell you that the number one issue right now impacting us is the influx of people coming here, newer people coming here, living under the bridges, living in the core of the city. Um, and with that being said, you know, working with Father Bills and trying to find wraparound services and housing is, um, in essence, what we need to do, right? We all grew up with the idea of a roof over our head. That's just what the idea of being a human being is all about. So, we will uh, not solve the issues tonight. We, we truly won't. We'd be naive to think that we would. But we need to come up with some plans, some stepping stones for success. Things that we're doing well right now, you'll hear about. We are doing things well. But also, uh, myself and Brenda Perez met today in my office with DA Tim Cruz. And the district attorney has pledged that he wants to work with us in terms of going after any type of um, offense, any type of criminal matter. If you see someone urinating or defecating on the sidewalk, uh, that's, that's a decent gross exposure. So that's, a, that's actually a, a level three sex offense. So we will um, continue to work with Brewster Ambulance, who is our provider. 
they pick up the needles in the city of Brockton, right? That's part of the contract. I am humbly asking and urging everybody, please do not take it upon yourself to pick up needles. We're seeing an uptick in fentanyl uh, wrapped around um, heroin, wrapped around uh, cocaine, so please don't. Um, and I have to deal with the gentleman every morning when I go to work at City Hall. I call Chief Brian Adeli. I have a gentleman that sleeps on the steps every single night at City Hall. Um, there's needles around him, um, and it's, it's a scary proposition uh, for him uh, and for myself because he is dealing with some mental behavioral health issues, there's no doubt about it. So tonight is the night that is long overdue. Um, I want to thank the businesses. I was able to do a walking tour with Mary recently. I know Dom is here. I saw Dominic walk in here. I know Sandra is here. But I also know this. I would be a naive individual if I didn't think there was a breaking point for people. Um, businesses saying the heck with Brock and we're moving out of here. We can't afford that. We, we can't. So we need to make sure that we come up with protocols that are quality of life protocols, public safety protocols, but also um, what I witness every day when I drive under the bridge are young children walking to the bluff. Um, those boys and girls shouldn't be seeing that. I didn't see that when I walked to school in Brockton. So um, I'm here today to listen and learn. You have to be an effective listener to be a good leader. But there are a lot of really educated folks, much smarter than me here. We have health clinicians. We have people that are dealing with homelessness. There's a lot of firefighters here. Father Matt's here from the Tribe Parish. So um, I am going to answer any questions that I can. Our city solicitor and attorney Verdia here because there are a lot of legal issues tied into this. But let me just be awfully clear about this. I am never, never going to kick someone down that's down already. I just won't do it. I'm the mayor of everybody in Brockton, those that have a house and those that don't have a house. So let's come up with some plans that are going to impact and benefit the lives of those people and try to give them the recipes of success that they all deserve, that we all deserve as human beings. So I do want to thank Jeff Thompson. He's been a true advocate and a true partner in this. So counsel. My name is Jeff Thompson and I am uh, Brockton's Ward 5 City Councilor. I want to thank Mary Waldron and the Downtown Business Association for organizing <clears throat> this event. And uh, Mayor Sullivan and all of our city department heads and our partner organizations uh, for just coming here tonight to discuss this extremely important topic. To be blunt, the state of our downtown is in crisis. Now, it's important to acknowledge the fear and the frustration uh, people have uh, when they come visit our downtown. The open drug use, the violence under our bridges, the encampments in our parks, the aggressive panhandling, and the general dirtiness of our downtown. Our downtown residents and our business owners are overwhelmed, and they are begging for our help. Now, over the past few months, I've been trying to educate myself on the issues of homelessness, mental health, and substance abuse. The lack of affordable housing, the closing of our mental health hospitals, and the overprescription of opioids, and the pandemic lockdowns have all created a tsunami that is currently washing over our city and other urban communities like Brockton. Now, we did not create this mess, but as elected officials, we are tasked with the responsibility of charting a path forward. Now, as the mayor said, we're not going to come uh, and solve this problem overnight, but we must put forth common sense policies that address the problem, both in the short term and the long term. And I want to be a part of that solution. So as, down to, as the downtown city councilor, I will sponsor and support any order or appropriation or ordinance that will help improve the current situation downtown. Now I know our city is facing challenging times, but I also know that the good people at this table and in this room can work together to find that path forward. I'm confident that can happen, and over the next two years, it's going to be—it's it's really going to be my main priority. So, thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussion. 
and uh, I look forward to continuing the discussion uh, at, you know, as we move forward and, and, and find solutions to this problem. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Um, there are a couple seats up here if anybody would like. Um, these are stakeholder seats. Come up to the table if you'd like. Um, I'm going to just, we are on time, actually three minutes ahead of time, which will give me a chance. Uh, if For those who may or may not have seen, there's been a SWOT analysis of strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats. And I'm not going to go through all of them tonight because I really do think that this part is really important. There are so many good things that are happening in downtown. And what when I talk about downtown, I'm in conversation with the Camp Fellow and Montel Business Association, along with the Greater Property Minority Business Association. We are pretty solid about making sure we're sharing information. But there are some incredible strengths in downtown. It's history, walkability, the current businesses, El Virus, Joe Angelos. Um, where else are our businesses? Just, and I know Ted Carmen has come in here. The residents, if anybody hasn't seen those, the downtown residents, the access to health care with the Naples Health Center, um, farmers market, right? There's all these great things. And there certainly are going to be um, you know, some of the weaknesses, and there are way too many, but let me just stop for a second. There was close to 200 people that took this analysis, so it's a very strong basis. In terms of pavement, sorry, Pat. The pavement that you're working on, this is the thing, though. There, that's progress. When you see the, 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 the construction and things, the roads that are being taken under, that's because it's gas lines and that's um, sewer lines, all the things that are important for bringing more people to downtown. Um, so some of the weaknesses then, you know, needles and drugs and bad lighting and yada yada, but we all know them. I'm not going to spend time on that. Um, the threats, I'm just going to do a couple highlights. I'm sorry, I'm going all over Megan. Um, you know, there are things, the drugs and the homelessness issue, um, not enough businesses, limited park, limited resources for parking, mental health, things, et cetera. Um, but, you know, there are opportunities, and that's what we're about today. You know, the business improvement district, and we've been, I've been working with the city planner, the mayor's office, the counselors, um, businesses about forming a business improvement district. There's not enough time to talk about it today, but it's a potential of a resource where where the property owners in downtown assess themselves and raise funds. That's not on necessarily the taxpayer's dollar. Um, public bathrooms and beautification. I know that there's a beautification program by the committee and the city and working with others. Um, the artwork, so, so it is that. Um, the artwork that the city planning office and the city's been working on, that's just starting to be initiated. Um, bicycle connections, the MPTA. Again, there's this opportunity. Way, way, way too many investments that have been made, um, human capital. Um, so if you haven't had to take a look at that, it will be on the um, PPA um, website. All of this information, there's a dedication to today's meeting, but also the strength. Um, we're going to be looking for ways as we continue through the DBA to, to work with the government and counselors and businesses to, um, to move these um, paths. So next on the agenda, we're talking about uh, what has happened in the past and what's currently become. Um, and I believe that I'm going to turn this over to the mayor and maybe to Jasmine um, to talk about what's going on. And then I know some of the department heads, and then I go to the various organizations, Father Bills and Bamsby and Proctor Neighborhood Health Center to talk about what they're doing. I, I do actually also want to thank Pastor Roberto, who's here. I know Dr. Wire, Pastor Wire is going to be here as well, that help out homeless populations. So, if you don't know Jasmine Brash here, first of all, you're missing an opportunity to be a great person, but um, she started her career. She's a licensed social worker. Um, she's got a master's degree. She worked at Father Bill's Mainspring. Um, the mayor's office used to have um, Corin Capiello as social services director. Corin went over to the schools, and I was very fortunate to be able to get Jasmine to uh, come and work in our office. Now, little did she know we'd be dealing with the ramifications of the pandemic and now an uptick of uh, TB uh, in Brockton, but also the homeless population. So I'm going to pass it over to her because she works with all of these people, all of these people every single day. But more importantly, she's out there walking the streets and talking um, and listening and learning. So Jasmine Brescia. Um, to start with things that we have done in the past, we have been working on initiatives to clear encampments out of our parks. Um, but the second we were informed that there were some concerns with that legally, we halted and changed 
the way we were addressing that to a more humane approach. So instead of moving people, we would ask them if they were willing to relocate. If they would take shelter, they are able to. Um, but we would still work with them on resources. And all of these different agencies that are at this table today were part of that process. All of us conduct outreach, whether it's together or in singular groups, depending upon availability, on a daily basis. Um, and that includes resources, supplies, whatever people might need to be able to survive. Um, additional things that we're doing is our office has resource packets that are individualized to the specific needs that people might have, and we provide those to anyone that comes in, whether they're coming from the street or not. But we also bring those to people if they are uncomfortable coming to us. Um, a lot of our work is meeting people where they are at, so if that is outside, then we will go to them. Um, but a lot of what we've done has had to shift to a different approach with some of the laws that are coming up. And I'm not going to speak directly to those. It's not something that I specialize in. Um, but a big part of what we're trying to do is be as humane as possible and making sure that people are getting the things that they need to survive, especially with the changes that are also taking place within the availability of our shelter system currently. And that includes having to be very creative and innovative with the things that we're implementing the different strategies that we have. And we do have a lot of ideas, but having your input would be great because just because I do this on a daily basis doesn't mean I understand the things that all of you are seeing. Um, some of the thoughts that we've had is whether or not it'd be appropriate to have one place for all of our encampments to be, finding ways to safely relocate people off of school property to more appropriate areas so that the children aren't being exposed to the things that they shouldn't be on a daily basis. Um, there are flyers that were given out with resources um, for a non-emergency police, fire, the mayor's office, and then resources that will help with their needles around that you can call to have them picked up so that you don't have to take care of that. Um, but in addition, I go out with our inspectional services department on a regular basis when we're addressing unsafe apartments for people because that is something else that's creating an impact in our homeless totals right now. So we are seeing apartments not being taken care of, and that is adding to our population. So those are things that we can address on the short term. Those are things that we want to take care of now before they get worse. Um, but in the long term, we have a lot of ideas as far as keeping under all of the bridges clean and working with the MBTA to make sure that the way we do so is humane and the people staying there are relocated rather than just told to find somewhere else to go. In addition to making sure that anyone outside is being given the supplies they need as well as regular wellness checks to ensure their health and safety. Um, we're expecting a not so great winter. So you'll see us out and about a lot. We'll answer any of your questions. Um, but we'll be there to make sure that everyone is all right. And that means that not just our homeless population, but anyone else can feel free to stop us as well if they have questions. Just, just one thing um, that Jasmine said that I hadn't known this until I became mayor. Um, you just assume that under the bridges is the sidewalk and it's owned by the city of Rockland, right? But it's not. It's owned by the Commonwealth. It's MBTA property because it actually is part of the train tracks. So we are working with MBTA. Um, we also um, instituted, if anybody happened to watch the State of the City address last year, we instituted a Clean City Initiative. And some people say, well, that's just words, but it's really not because every Monday and Friday I meet in my office at 8.30 with Pat Hill, who's at DPW Commissioner. He's got three street, street, street sweepers that go out every single day. Um, they do it in quadrants around the city of Brockton. I've charged him to make sure that you clean under the bridges. Um, we put trash barrels there. Some of the folks are actually are utilizing the trash barrels. Tim Carpenter, who is uh, our parks commissioner, he's charged with cleaning all the parks, not just DW, any of the parks or parkless in the city of Brockton. We are having some residents living in some of these parks. So Tim is out there. He is charged with Perkins Park, which again has become a big issue next to Father Bill's Main Spring, right? Father Bill's Main Spring is going to be leaving in about two years to go up the Manly Street. So we just have to be a little patient with that. But Perkins Park is going to be reimagined and, and revitalized at that time. Um, and then the last person that is involved in this is Jim um, Pluff, who is the um, building commissioner for the city of Brockton. So he is charged with all of the grounds that are city-owned assets. 
So I, I just wanted to reiterate again, because I did not know that until just recently, that the MBTA literally owns some of these bills. Now, they want to work with us. Jeff's been a great advocate working, and John has. Um, but we are trying to work with the Commonwealth, with the delegation who's been great, Senator and the Free Rest. Thank you, Mayor. I think I'm going to pass this on to Chief Perez, um, and then um, other from the department, then we're going to go to um, others on this side. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to address all of you. As the police chief, I understand the importance of addressing these issues and ensuring a safe and vibrant community for our residents, for all residents and businesses. The issues we're discussing today are complex and multifaceted with many underlying causes, economic hardship, mental health challenges, and addiction. And it requires collaborative effort, and that's what we're hoping to do here today. For our part, I'd like to provide some insight as to what the Brockton Police Department is currently doing and will continue to do to address these challenges. We currently have walk and beats, bike beats, and link up shifts to Campbell, Montello, and the downtown area. Our link up uh, shifts is a two prong uh, approach where it's outreach and target targeting. Our outreach approach has a uh, recovery coach with an officer go out. Basically, oh, can everybody hear me? Yeah, All right. So it goes out partners with an officer or recovery coach to address quality of life issues and also to um, outreach to people who suffer from substance use disorders and help them with resources and assist individuals to get to those resources. We also have, as part of Link Up, um, we have purchased 450 lights. 100, and I'll let Pat talk about that, 100 of which have been um, installed, and we still have 350 to install. So we have that. We also have um, directed patrols to guide to Garda Road, White Ave, Park, uh, Perkins Park, and the School Street Bridge. The Brockton Police Department also has um, full-time clinicians. We have one full-time clinician, one part-time clinician. They're out there. They answer calls for service for anybody who presents with a behavioral or mental health issue, again, to try to um, get them the resources and the assistance that they need. We also have under review uh, by the law department, the road safety um, ordinance that is currently under review and all that the solicitor speak to that. Um, so those are some of the things that we are currently doing and we're here to basically address any and all issues um, as far as uh, law enforcement is concerned, that we are able to. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Brian Andelli. I'm the fire chief here in the city. Uh, you know, I think to the mayor's point, I'm a lifelong resident. Um, I am proud of the city every day, and I think, um, especially in the downtown area with everything that's been going on, we're at a precipice of breaks. And I think, um, you know, some of the some of the situations we're handling, just like uh, Councilor Thompson said, these are not these are not specific to Brockton. Uh, I talk to fire chiefs all over the Commonwealth on a regular basis, and uh, they're all addressing the same issues. Uh, one of the things I can speak to uh, uh, um, that we um, we will get in touch with Brewster after um, someone calls through our fire alarm office. They, you're not supposed you're not to be calling Brewster directly because a lot of times they're unaware of that. So if you call. Our 583 now to our fire alarm operators, they make sure that happens. Um, so, as far as statistics go, um, some of the things we've been seeing, I, I said that I've been here my entire life. I, I not only worked as a firefighter, I worked in EMS prior to my career in the fire service. And, and part of that was I worked for the ambulance provider that was prior to Brewster. Um, and we've always dealt with a population in the city that's been in the situation we're in now. What it, what it appears, though, in speaking, some of, some of our firefighters are here, in speaking to them, one of the things we're, we're dealing with more now is more of an aggressive nature. Um, we're, 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 it, was a, it was more of a, an all branch out there to try to help these folks. That's not always necessarily the case with us, with the EMS crews, I'm sure with the police officers as well. Um, and I, I, I don't know what the specifics are behind that, whether it be, um, you know, obviously mental health, um, drug addiction issues, 
Uh, I can't speak to that. Some of the statistics I can give you, when we look at the numbers in our first fire district, and that's how we have the city laid out for fire service, um, is the downtown area. A lot of what your downtown business area is. Um, you know, since uh, May 1st of 2023, we've, we've uh, had, we've responded to 25 overdoses, 30 medicals overall. We've also had some fires, um, debris fires, uh, whether they were, now this is only, again, this does not include the parks. One of them being a car fire the other day. Um, our, our personnel are out there every day, um, and, and obviously, sometimes these folks don't want to go to the hospital. One of the, one of the things we've run into over the years, it's a concern, and, and anyone who understands a little background in opioids, like I'm sure a lot of people in this room that, that work with these folks every day, is this will be a, this will be a in the system a lot longer, especially what it's being used with nowadays. Um, when I worked in EMS, we'd give them one shot of Narcan, and that was it, and we'd move on, get them to the hospital, and we'd take care of one of the most difficult things that we're running into now is we'll get them three, four, five, six, seven, eight shots of Narcan, and they're difficult to rouse, difficult to get back breathing. And then if they do, they don't want to go to the hospital. Um, we all know what the health situation is on the South Shore right now, all the closures of hospitals. Um, but that opioid will back, will back, back into the hemoglobin table and take over the body again once the Narcan wears off. So that's a huge concern about they could be overdose after you even left the scene if they don't want to go. And the problem being with that is that we met some folks last week that um, once they're conscious alert and only gets to person, place, and time, we cannot take them if they don't want to go. It does not matter if they overdose or not. So it puts us in a very precarious position, it puts our crews in a very precarious position, whether they're the firefighters or the EMS providers that arrive from crews. So, um, that's, that's where we stand. Uh, those are the efforts that we've put forward thus far. That's what we're addressing um, on a daily basis, uh, on an hourly basis. So. You're welcome. Well, I'm happy to talk about it. How's everybody doing? Uh, Pat, I'd love to give you permission. Uh, I think my role in, as the mayor has talked about a little bit is we've been involved with this Clean City Initiative. Um, you know, the DPW's role in this whole, whole situation is, is to try to keep downtown as clean as possible. Um, we do handle a lot of the uh, cleanups that, that are involved in the sidewalk areas, all the cleanups that are involved in the streets. We handle all the street lighting issues that, that occur all, all throughout the city. Um, and, and, and we try to you know, maintain a relationship with, with these people downtown because you know a lot of times the people that are cleaning up after these people um, we, we get a lot of slack, so we try to be cognizant of these people um, and their feelings. So we do the best we can with what we have, um, and, and if people have problems, we try to work with, with business owners and, um, you know, with, with, with cleanups, you know, whether it be on private property, we have people with private property pull up stuff onto the public property where we work with them to get removed uh, as much as we can. Um, but it's, it's a difficult situation, and we meet on it, uh, you know, two or three times a week, and we're just trying to do the best we can. Thank you, Pat. I just want to recognize those that you can already see. We have Montel Business Association, uh, Metro Southern Chamber of Commerce, and a number of other folks to just appreciate for you. Um, um, and then from, from the district attorney's office is on as well. Um, I am going to turn it over to this side, and then John um, from Father Bills, and we're going to go talk to the Neighborhood Health Center and the family. So just go right to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. John Yaswinski, Father Bills of the Mainspring. Um, Thank you for having us tonight, Mayor and Mary. Um, so, so, as everybody said here, we're all seeing more encampments, more people since COVID, no matter what community you are, not just in Massachusetts, but in the country right now, people struggling with homelessness. A little bit of history, at least, um, what we've seen. I've been at Father Bill's in Spring, um, Part of the mainstream side since 2007, so part of the Rockton side. Um, there was a tent city here in the city for over 20 plus years. Uh, the CSX railroad property for a long time, longer than actually the mainstream house was here. And there was probably over 30 to 40 individuals living out there. So we've had people sleeping outside in the Rockton community. For 30 to 40 plus years. Now, 
I understand past administrations decided to level that campsite for liability and safety concerns. But what that did do is that spread out the group of people that we used to outreach that were hidden. And I think we're still seeing that, plus the COVID, where a lot of people during COVID, no matter if you were struggling with homelessness or you are struggling with an addiction or mental health issues during COVID, you weren't getting treatment because everything shut down. And we are now seeing a major increase of mental health and substance use, physical, medical issues that are just getting dealt with now that we're catching up with. We have a broken mental health and substance abuse system in the Commonwealth. It's broken. And it's easy, and we'll take it tonight, it's easy to blame a lot of the providers that every day are from our community and our employees and our volunteers and our public safety officials and our officials here, city officials, to blame us. But I can tell you, as a regional provider um, throughout South Eastern Mass is what I can say is I really appreciate the Brockton community with the leadership we have here, um, this great communication. We are working together. This is a daunting issue, but it's bigger than a homeless issue. Homelessness issue is the final result of not dealing with our mental health and substance use issues and the housing issues that need to be dealt with. So, we are the safety net for other building things, right? Um, we now, things that we're moving forward with is, as the mayor has said, and we really appreciate the political support of the mayor, city council, the delegation, I don't know if Senator Brady is here, as the leader, is to move Mainsburg House out of downtown Brockton. And moving it out will help. But what we're excited about when it goes over to, on the, closer to the VA campus on Manly Street is we're reinventing what we're going to do. It's not going to be a nighttime shelter. It's going to be 24-7. It's going to be about prevention, diverting, and rapidly rehousing people. But it's also going to be keeping people so they don't leave during the day. We can't force people to stay. But we're going to allow people to stay so they don't have to roam through the community. We are in a library today. Libraries across this country are the day programs for homeless people. So Father Bill's Mainspring is stepping up and saying we will keep people and give them an opportunity to stay with us. We are here for the business community, our neighbors, our business leaders, our civic leaders, and our political leaders to just be part of the conversation, be part of the solutions. We want a vibrant community. Our employees live in this community. Our volunteers are from here. There is a great group of people here. If it's Bansley, if it's Brockton Day with Health Services, and so many other people. We're also very willing to see and look at as an organization, but as a city. Let's look at best practices across this country. There is more Brocktons in this country than there are Bostons. We need to worry about Brockton, and we need to think about what we can do and not point fingers at each other. How do we deal with the mental health and substance abuse issues? So, housing works. I'm a housing advocate. We take people, we have 700 plus units of housing. People think of Father Bill's Mean Spring as a Mean Spring shelter. We have over 700 units of housing in our inventory. Our housing is only for the chronic homeless individual or family. And when I say chronic homeless, that's the person that struggles the most with substance abuse, mental health, physical, or behavioral health disabilities. That's the most difficult person. 70% of the people that come to the Spring House just stay with us for a few days, a few weeks, a few months. They get on their feet, they go into treatment, 
or they get back into their family, they get a job, they move on. There is a core group of 30 to 40 percent of the people that we see that we're probably talking about tonight that is the chronic person that when we have eight state hospitals, mental health institutions in the 70s and in the 80s, and many of us were around then, few of us probably in this room don't remember that, that was over 20,000 housing units, as bad as it was. We're down to two state hospitals, and we're down to 800 beds. And we never, as a state, produced the housing for that population. We still, though, we still have the need to take care of each other. Our fastest growing population in our father pills in the mainstream is 60 and older. Fixed income, elderly, disabled people. It's a national issue. It's not just our issue here. So I just hope as we progress, we move forward, we can do it together. We have established Things move going forward is, as the mayor said, we're excited about moving Main Spring out of the downtown and creating a 24-7 housing resource center that will be a shelter on Main Street, but also will focus on those interventions as I talked about. We also got the state to invest in a street outreach program that we just implemented a year or two ago because we saw the growth and the state thing really gave us some money. So with that, I'll wrap up my comments. I'm going to turn it over to John Lamb, our Chief Operating Officer, that can speak briefly about what our team is seeing, what we're doing outside, and how we're coordinating with each other. Thank, thank you. John, you can just be, first of all, thank you. We are running behind on schedule, but, but important comments. So if we could be pointed, and then we're going to have um, Allison speak next. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be very brief. Um, John covered most of you know the good work that's happening. Just so you know, we currently have two full-time outreach workers that are going out with Brock Neighborhood Health Center, with Bamsey, with Jasmine, with all the other providers, including Pastor Roberto and Judy and their crew. We have this group that works collaboratively to really look at what are the resources that each group can bring to the individuals that are staying outside. We like to look at it from housing and case management and we know there are medical providers, harm reduction providers, other people that do the work much better than we can. So I think it's one of the great things about Brock is the agencies work really closely together to say, what do you do really well, what do we do well, and making sure we're not duplicating those efforts. Currently tonight um, at Main Spring House, I know we're talking about the encampments, people staying outside, but just in terms of numbers, Main Spring House is also incredibly full. Uh, we have been seeing much higher numbers than we have you know, over the past year. Uh, we are currently probably going to have about 130 people staying at the shelter tonight. That means probably 15 to 20 people will actually be sleeping on mats on the floor because we've run out of beds. Uh, we have been in these numbers since the springtime. Normally these are the numbers we're at in winter, and we expect this to be a tough winter. We know there's people that are currently staying outside that are going to come into the shelter, which we will welcome them in. We will make space for them, make sure we're continuing to provide what's needed for individuals to be safe. But th we're seeing these numbers increase across the state. As we talk to other state providers, we're hearing about their increases. We are getting a lot more calls from communities we never heard from in our region. Abington, Rockland, Middleborough, Maine. and Stoughton have all called Father Bills and Main Springs outreach team within the past couple weeks to say, we're seeing more people staying outside. How can you engage with us? So while we know like this meeting is about downtown Brockton, like this is a statewide trend that we're seeing and something providers are really trying to figure out what is the best response. How do we get people into housing as fast as possible and make sure we're connecting with individuals? Good evening. My name is Allison Hingelberg. I'm the Director of Substance Use Services at Brockton Neighborhood Health Center. Um, so that means that I supervise all of our programs that provide um, substance use treatment, harm reduction services, as well as medical services um, to people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, I'm here tonight with our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Joe Canarian Langer, and our Director of Social Services, Maria Piancel. Um, Mary says we're running behind schedule, and it would probably take me another 30 minutes to tell you about all the different medical and behavioral health services that we offer at the health center because it's a lot. Um, we serve more than 37,000 patients a year, so we are providing a lot of medical and behavioral health services um, in the community. So some of the ones we were going to highlight tonight focus on uh, how we're supporting downtown, right? So obviously our main site is here downtown, um, but we also have um, a clinic that is located in Main Spring House. 
small, it's one exam room, a full-time nurse practitioner who's there to serve residents of the shelter and people who are otherwise unhoused to make sure that they get medical care, that they're linked into behavioral health care, and get treatment for their substance use disorders. Um, in 2021, we also started a mobile program. You might see us wheeling a very large trailer <laughs> around the city. Um, it's really fun on some of the tiny streets. Um, but it's a um, mobile program um, that serves people um, who are still struggling with their substance use, who are in need of on-demand medical care. So that means I have a wound, it's starting to look uh, not so great, I'm gonna get you antibiotics right now. Hey, I'm ready for treatment today. That's great, we're gonna start right now. Um, so making sure that people really get what they need when they're ready, um, because we know that people get better. We see it every single day, and so I think that um, that's really what keeps us going. Um, I think we know there's a lot going on in downtown and we want to be supporters of, of the people who are, who are here. The three people who are sitting here tonight are also three of the people who set up um, your large scale COVID testing site during COVID. And so I say that like, we've been in this fight for a really long time. We're tired. <laughs> we were a little tired. Um, but we were doing it before COVID. We were doing it during COVID and we're doing it now because we care. We probably care a little bit too much. And um, we're here because we value the partnership we have with Father Bills. We're, we value the partnership we have with the city, with the Cope Center, with you know all of the different departments in the city. Um, we really want to be able to bring the expertise we have in medical and behavioral health care into how we address this in the city. We want to make sure that the the strategies that we use uh, keep people alive, that it improves their health, and that they work, that they promote health, they promote safety, and that they work for the community. And that's the expertise I think the three of us are hoping to bring to this to say, you know, it, it's easy to throw a lot of ideas around, it's easy to say, you know, we're going to do this. But sometimes, you know, we go back, we get nerdy, we look at the science, we're like, that doesn't work sometimes, maybe let's try this. And so we really want to be a part of this conversation um, and to bring some solutions forward. Um, Mary so kindly said to remind everyone that a lot of what we do is street outreach. Um, if there are people who are outside and someone from the mobile team needs to go and check on them, or you even just have questions, I think we're here to support, because there's a lot of things that are unknown. So I heard the fire chief talking about fentanyl. Fentanyl actually doesn't last as long as other opioids. It means you have to inject more often, more times a day. That's more syringes, right? So that means that, um, we adapt the services that we provide, and so I think having the kinds of conversations like that um, help us bring forward solutions that work. So just ask ask the questions, because I think um, one, I, I've heard people say, oh, well, how many syringes a day does someone need? And sometimes someone tells me one. <laughs> it's not one, it's many more than one, right? And so just being able to have really um, honest <coughs> conversations so that we understand what some of our most vulnerable community members are going through and how we work together to solve some of those problems. So we've been in the fight, we're here to stay in the fight, we're here with you, and um, we're tired, but we're gonna stay here. Um, so I don't wanna take too much of Mary's time, but I know folks that I have some comments as well, but thank you for having us. Good evening, my name is Mary Corlin. I am the Director of Harm Reduction Services for BMZ. I oversee the Health Center along Pleasant Street. It is a harm reduction center. I am accompanied by our VP, um, Jessica Almeida. Um, again, as Allison said, it would take quite a while to run through all of the services we provide, but I will give you a quick rundown. Um, there have been 55,000 plus people that have received GMZ services each year. Um, the Pope Center has been open for many years, I think close to two decades actually. Um, but since we went back to July 2022, because that's when our fiscal year started. Um, since then we've collected 170,600 syringes. Um, we have had 5,600 service encounters, so that's people walking in our door for different things. Um, 1,617 unique individuals. 543 tests, um, HIV, hepatitis C, and FDI tests. 
and close to 3,000 doses of Narcan provided, along with overdose prevention training and education. Um, we provided 73 referrals to substance use treatment um, by our full-time case managers. We provide street outreach, um, wound care, referrals to medical care, including HIV and hepatitis B treatment. Our syringe services include disposal and education. So we go out on street outreach. It used to be once a week we go, once a day. Um, we branch that up to twice a week. We have a very small team of about five staff members. We need two in-house to operate and at least two for safety reasons to go out into the community. Um, but we are doing it at least twice a week now. Um, we also provide items such as coats, shoes, blankets, socks, hygiene supplies, hygiene products, blankets, things that, that can be very life-saving. Um, I know it may just seem like a coat or some warm clothes, but we've had our participants have lost limbs due to frostbite during the winter. So when we give out blankets and tents, some people may not see that as a life-saving item. But when those tents or blankets are taken away, people can lose limbs, people can die. Those are, those are life-saving items. Um, we build relationships with our participants every day. We see them Monday through Friday. They come to our door. They talk to us about their their lives, what's going on. We try to provide services for, you know, anything that they need. Um, but our main focus is keeping them alive and as safe as possible. Um, I am also a lifelong Brockton resident, and I'm very proud to be one. Um, I am also a person in recovery and a person that has experienced homelessness myself. Um, and Mary asked me to keep it short, so I will, but in closing, I just want to say that as a per person that has experienced some of these things, um, I would suggest that we look towards adding more services like these and not take away any of them. Thank you. So I just, ooh, sorry. I just also wanted to say this is not this side versus this side. <laughs> 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 I really don't have to in the middle because I've had a chance to be on all sides and have a conversation. I don't know for those of you who are sitting, particularly in the audience, if, if, you, if this is the first time you're hearing about the things that have been going on. But I have been hearing, and I think that's when I hear it. Sometimes I'm not able to translate it to a property owner, but to Mary and to Alice and to John and John. I mean, it is the work that you do along with Jasmine side by side, along with um, Lieutenant Schleiman from the police department. I know the, 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 the city council, the mayor, the, and, the, and the police department has gone from a part-time to a full-time for, for mental health services. Um, so I'm going to keep it shut because I've been not focusing, but I didn't want to you know, diminish what you were all saying, but it is really important. Um, we are now going to be heading into stakeholders um, to have you come up to the podium. I'm going to let um, Rocky from the act. I will be serving as a well, uh, My name is Raymond Dexter Baker. I'm the Director of Public Safety Services for the I came here four years ago because my mother got sick and I became her caregiver. And when I came here, I didn't know that we had so many problems. I'm not a judge, I'm not judgmental or nothing. But I knew we had problems because I heard, I knew Brockton had a problem because I heard it from Boston. But I accepted the challenge to come up here and take care of my mother. I don't do drugs. I did 15 years in prison. But when I came in here, I seen the problem that they had and I didn't, it wasn't me, I didn't want to get involved with it. I knew I wasn't going to I wanted to become helpful to them because I've been through so much. But when I came here, I fell in love with it. The people, even though they was you no, know, they they had the um they had addictions and all that, 
I, it just gravitated because I've been through that in the 80s. I'm 55 years old. I've been through the drug, I did it, the drugs, the alcohol, all that. But I know that I had to accept the challenge to come here, you know what I'm saying, and introduce myself. And that's what I've been doing. I've been to the church. I met the Father Bills. I got kicked out of Father Bills. <laughs> you know, because of my stupidity. You know what I'm saying? I don't blame Father Bill. Nice place. You know? But I fell in love with the city. I'm not going nowhere. I met a girl, Carrie, right there. And she's the one that's keeping me here because she loves it here. You know, I'm not an embarrassed man here. I love the people. The leaders, they great. I've been involved with Stairway. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to get in. No, I'm staying away from the drugs. But I think I could, you know, the people see, I walk around and I respect them. They talk to me. They don't enter. They don't, you know, tell me do I want drugs or nothing like that. They see that I'm just trying to, you know what I'm saying? They, I want them to follow my example, you know? I've been there. I did 15 years. I did 10 years before that. I was a bad boy, you know? I did my dirt, you know what I'm saying? But when they see me, they, they see me, you know, keeping my head up high. And I got some people stopped doing drugs, stopped drinking. And I've been to Father Bill's. I slept there. They became, they was a good host. And I hope I was a good guest. I treated them well, as they treated me well, you know. But I love Brock. My name is Raymond Etheridge. Been here four years. <laughs> love it. I got 60 seconds. I can sink a ship in 60 seconds. <laughs> Uh, my name is Steve Abrams, uh, adopted by the city of Brockton. When their eyes was watching God, this city was helping me raise my children. Uh, when their eyes was watching God, we all came out of our silos and came together. I question, when I travel throughout the city, I'm a therapist, recovery, I mean, a facilitator at the VA hospital, pro bono. I do group therapy, art therapy on, on, on the cuff. Uh, one thing I went to uh, Metro South Bridgewater Chambers of Commerce meeting, and they was attracting people to come live there. And my concern is my children came across the bridge of this education system. The bridge is now burning on both sides. Uh, they have professional jobs. They went to college, but they live in Bridgewater. Uh, they attracted them to bring them here. So when their eyes was watching God, what was we doing? We had the kids road race. We had uh, the, the soccer leagues, we had the summer school program, summer reading program, that's us. We had that. We had that. We came out of our silos and we came together to help our children. Now it's war ready because of the drugs, because of the infestation. I survived crack. Uh, Hakeem Jeffries stood on the House Congress and he said he survived the crack epidemic. So we understand what addiction is and what it does to a city and what it does to an infrastructure. But we all came out of our silos because our eyes was watching God. So I want to just thank everybody that doing the work. My daughter came out of uh, COPE. She used to do the patrol, Eden Abrams. She came and working through the system there and fearless because her eyes was watching God. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Cynthia Pendergast, and I'm going to first talk about how proud I am to be a Brockton resident. I took a chance on Brockton almost 40 years ago. And when I got to the city, I knew there was work to do. And I knew that I couldn't do it alone. But if I did my part, guess what? That's what it takes. It takes partnership. And so I started working with youth. And I started to get involved back then with my church and, and just any way I could. Worked with the Boy Scouts and, and all these different groups. And then fast forward, I started work for NeighborWorks Housing Solutions. And so we're downtown. My office is downtown. I work on Frederick Douglass, and I volunteer at the park, and I see everything, right? I talk to the people that pass by, the, the, the ones that are homeless that say, thank you, you know, and how can we help? And, um, you know, we live in a city. There's work to do, right? So NeighborWorks works with Father Bell's Mainstream. We create housing. We um, built 121 Main. We're, we're working on, we build senior housing, all different things. So... Guess what? We're doing it. We're willing to partner. But me as an individual, I'm going to champion Brockton. Because guess what? Struggle wants to look for blame, right? And when I see that, I say that is not productive. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is look how we can partner. Because that's how any work that we're going to do to make the city better is going to happen. We've got to partner with each other. And so let's look for solutions. 
let's celebrate the partnerships, but let's look for the bright spots in our city, right? How can we make it better? Yes, we have people in our city that are struggling and we have to treat them with compassion. They are somebody's daughter. They're somebody's son. There might be somebody's, they're a parent, right? We don't know what, what, how they got to where they are, but guess what? What does love look like? Love your neighbor. What does that look like? That's what we got to ask ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joe Simshauser. Um, I'm a peer specialist, um, recovery coach. I live here, lived on White Ave for like seven years. I've been clean from heroin for eight. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I worked at the Gandara Center for a little bit, um, and I was out on the street in my neighborhood because White Ave, my, I, I lived across the street in a blue house. So this is my neighborhood. These are my friends. I've known them for years. Uh, that's my recovery coach right there. These are my providers right here. I love you guys. You guys are awesome. Seriously, moms do care. Brockton Neighborhood Health Center, they're the best. So, um, I was out in the field on foot every single day. So the problem we are having right now that um, I haven't heard spoken about is xylazine. Um, so we were speaking about the overdoses and how it takes so many to bring them back. And then um, they won't respond even when you do bring them back. So you'll give them a bunch of Narcan, their breathing will regulate, but they won't, and their eyes will be open, but they will not respond, they're unresponsive. And that's the xylazine, it's a horse tranquilizer. What that does is it creates holes in their skin. I have pictures, I have videos, they're holes like crocodile, gaping holes down to the bone, the muscle. One of my kids had an artery, down to the femoral artery, a hole, their ulcers, their skin ulcers. So we're having a huge problem with that out on the street right now. So because of that, they can't take care of themselves as much. They can't go up to the Cope Center anymore. They can't go up the street no more. They can't get food for themselves anymore. They can't even make it to the champion plan anymore. So like the need for people like Callie, she's on the trailer. She's the one on the trailer. Callie, she's the one out there with me. Was we, when, yeah, we were out there. Not together, we don't work together. But um, like, people like, oh my God, I just forgot what I was saying. What was I saying? Outreach, Outreach. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that's where I like to be. I like to be out, out there like with these people. They're my friends. Everything's getting harder. Um, everything's more expensive. Homelessness is, so it's wicked expensive to be homeless, actually, by the way. Um, like, super expensive. Um, and, like, it's getting cold fast, and, like, we need supplies and stuff like that. So, I mean, I'm not exactly sure who I'm talking to, but, like, I'm just trying to share information that I saw while I was out there. Um, also, like, I hear people say a lot of the times, like, the people who want to go versus the people who don't want to go. And, like, I have a problem with that in particular because... Like, these people are so sick that, like, the thought of getting help is painful. Like, the depression is so deep because you have to, you have to lower yourself so deep when you're homeless. Like, you have to, like, almost become uncivilized and, and, and think of yourself as less than other people. So you have to, you get, end up getting wicked depressed, and that's wicked hard to get out of. You don't have energy. It's hard to think. It's hard to concentrate, make good decisions, and make good judgments. So, like, they are very sick, so they don't want to live like that. But just because they say they don't want to go right now doesn't mean they don't deserve a better quality of life. That's what I'm big on. Better quality of life for the people who aren't ready. That's why we need people like me, people like Callie. I didn't even know Father Bill did outreach like that. I'm about to come see y'all tomorrow. We need to get outreach. That's all I'm saying. Good evening. I'm Ozzy Jordan. I was listening to some of the folks in here. This gentleman here that was talking about the state uh, um, mental health places, it was crazy. They wanted to save a couple of dollars, and look what's happened over all these years. Um, department, somebody said DPW downtown, clean. We don't want to forget the rest of the city, then it ends up looking like downtown. But my thing is solutions. We got a city, let's make it a big experiment for people. You get a lot of companies that like to talk about their products. Contact the companies, uh, your tents, your, your sleeping bags, your this, your that, the other that we could use. Some places, school places or 
city lots at night. People who have to live in their cars, <coughs> excuse me, could go in there, be safe, because there's somebody in there that's going to watch them. Uh, they got no place to go. Being on the streets doesn't make sense. We ask these companies to give us certain things, and they can use us as part of their advertisement. This is what we did. Somewhere here in this United States, every problem we've had or have, somebody's come up with a solution. You have to contact people nationwide to find out what they did. Make it work for us. It's that simple. It takes time, but we always sit around doing, what are we going to do? You know, we can't do that. We need to do these things now. Winter's coming on. Um, we watched what happened over on the vineyard. They brought in, what was it, 50 people, whatever it was. What did they? They threw them down in the, uh, uh, on the Cape, in the, in the, the military base down there. In a month, they found places for them to go. We can do it again. Take our people, put them down there. Then they'll find a place for them. So, I mean, anything that we can do. We've got the uh, different places within the city and the state that do certain things. Some of it, we only use them when it's a, a real big problem, but this is a problem. Contact them, tell them to come in, help us. That's it. See you later. Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Jed. Um, I live uh, across from the, so I live in the Soco Lofts, and I'm also a condo trustee there. So in a way, I represent 64 other unit owners there. Uh, I would say in, uh, a few points. One, I used to be a youth outreach worker in Boston, so I, and I really love the, what the outreach folks here have to say, and there's so much wisdom here. Uh, and I watched the council hearing a few weeks ago, and I would encourage uh, when many of the same folks here were able to speak at much greater length, and I, I learned so much about what the city's doing and, and, and the observations you're making. And, and so I would encourage anybody to go on YouTube and the Brockton channels, and, and I forget the date of that hearing, but you can find that hearing. There's a lot. If you really want to do a deep dive into this. Um, one of the things I think that still needs to change is uh, I like to use C-Click Fix, and it seems to me that there's uh, what you might call the, the dispatch part of it as to who's responsible is there's too much passing the buck. So for example, I reported human feces at the bottom of the stairs at the Brockton train station. I have screenshots of this stuff. A month and a half later, it was finally closed uh, by, uh, let's see, by utilities. Pardon my apologies. Closed by the highway department. This is not a highway department issue. But initially, it was referred from the health department to uh, the highway department, and then I think to trash and debris dumping, and then to utilities, water, and sewer. Then it was assigned to the health department. Uh, the health department said, we do not do power washing. Now, <laughs> with all due respect, I, mean, I used to work for Mayor Menino in Boston. Menino would have had someone fix it. I mean, it, it would have happened. So perhaps there needs to be someone with authority there to get the other departments in line to take care of these issues. More recently, my girlfriend and I were walking. I, she says, what's, we, what's, what's on the second floor of the back garage? We went up there, we saw a needle. See, so click, fix that. The response I got was to call the fire department. I didn't know that that, that was the protocol at the time for the, for the needle, so it just seemed like buck passing, but also someone who's not motivated like me, who's just trying to make a report, like a regular citizen, uh, might feel like, oh, well, they don't, want to take care of the issue. So I would suggest that if, if in that case, that I think that report should have been transferred by the city to, to the fire department and not like throw it back on the citizens, so to speak. Um, in terms of what the environment is like down there, I would argue that the main problem we have in our building is, is the threat of package theft. Uh, I did scare away a, a woman at our door the other day who should not have been there, uh, but it's not as bad today as it used to be. It is an open question for us what happens when the public safety center opens and the Brockton police are not across the street from us anymore. And that to some is a scary thought. Uh, in terms of, uh, so the folks under the bridge by me, under the Center Street Bridge, uh, very tall gentleman there, I, I don't know his name, but he's always been very respectful. The woman who lives under the bridge who likes to yell a lot, uh, she's never been a problem. Uh, but even the tall gentleman, he's moved, and I asked him what happened. He said someone else came along, and, and, and he had to leave. 
terms of the School Street Bridge, I really feel that the quality has changed there, as many other people have said uh, online. It's, it's the environment feels completely different. And I would argue there that um, there's got to be some, not only the passion side, but it's also the enforcement side. And I would suggest uh, one, and I get that you have problems with probable cause and other things like that. One suggestion I would have is that blue bikes, there are no blue bikes in Brockton. Someone has a blue bike. I think that's probable cause to ask them what they're doing now and search them. So I uh, thank you. Hi, Michelle Henson, longtime Brockton resident. Um, I want to thank Jasmine personally and publicly because I've learned a lot from her, from her graciously allowing me in on the calls on Wednesday. And I would encourage anybody who wants to know about this problem to please join in on this call because you don't know what you don't know. Um, we have to find a space between not pointing fingers because I can respect that. I definitely can, but we have to also find a space for accountability. We need both. Um, when we talk about mental health, when we talk about addiction, I hear it spoken about too simplified, and I'd like to speak to you more about it because there's a lot of people out here treating real medical issues, self-medicating, because they can't get the help from the medical community. And let me let you all not eat for a few days or a few weeks and let your nutrients slip, the building blocks of your brain, and let me see how you act. So we need to try to all work together, look a little bit deeply at the, the more the nuances, and try to work together. I want a partner and not be less adversarial, more partnership. And that's my commitment. Hi, everybody. Hi, my name is Ellie Texera. I'm a longtime Brockton resident, and I'm very biased to these folks over here just because I have worked with them in many different um, settings, and the work that you guys do every day is amazing. And I feel you when you say you're tired, because I'm tired. I'm exhausted, and I'm sure so many people here that work in the community day in and day out are tired of seeing the same thing. This is not something that started last year or the year before. This started years ago, okay? Um, during COVID, my daughter and I was, um, with the help of the late Dory Smith, we were feeding people under the bridge. We were giving them blankets that she was making and scarf that, um, scarf and mask that she was making, and me and my daughter was delivering it for them. So this is something that's been going on in Brockton for years, and it has been brought to the attention of people, and some people have closed their eyes to it because they don't live in that neighborhood. They don't walk in that neighborhood. Their kids are not walking past what's going on under those bridges. So if you don't see it, it's out of sight and you don't care about it because you're only coming to the city hall on the other side of Main Street to go to your office. When you talk about you want partnership, these are your partners because we're in the community every day. We're working in the community every day. If you want to know what type of folks we have, come down to the DTA office. I am there. I will give you a tour. I work there. I worked for DHCD. That's now the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Community, and now I'm at DTA. Come visit me. I have told many of the counselors to come down and see what folks need in the city. No one has yet come down. Go down to Neighborhood Health Center and see what they're dealing with and see how you can help them. Father Bill and Mainspring, they've been doing it for years. Go down there and see what they're doing. I hope that this meeting does not just stay here and that you guys actually partner up with us, not just people that you guys are friends with and that you guys know will tell you guys what you want to hear. None of us in here will tell you what you want to hear. We will tell you the reality of what's happening in this city. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Callie. I work at Brockton Neighborhood Health Center. I used to work at Father Bills in Main Spring. Um, I work with these people every day. I live in this community. I am a person in recovery. I stayed in Tent City before. Tent City was demolished. I was there when it got knocked down. It's not 
Jess, there's so much more that stems from all of this. We need to come together as a community. Some of these people don't want to be housed. They want to stay on the streets. And we need to come together as a community and figure out, OK, how can we accommodate that but keep our city clean and safe? I have a child here. I, you know, I'm from here. I want to see the city thrive. And I think that if we all came together and didn't just point fingers at everybody, then maybe we could make this work and everybody could be happy in the end. And if anyone has any questions, I work at the Health Center. My name is Callie. Feel free to come and ask. Thank you to the community. Thank you to all of you who are in front of me. Uh, my name is Veronica. And I, um, I was born in Cape Verde, but raised in Brockton, now live in a, near, um, a nearing town. But I started an organization for single moms called Victory for Families. And I'm just here as, as a resource. And I'm here to say that we are um, new in the infancy stage of everything. But I'm coming into this space to be able to uh, be pliable and to see what the needs are. And I would love to sit with some of you to see how we can come in to the space and offer the support that you need in the areas of housing, employment, education, and things like of that sort. Um, my population is single moms, but I'm sure there's so much more that we can do together. So I'm just kind of here as like a, a support for anyone that's in need. Thank you. And also a couple folks who are, are develop, developers, um, one in particular has young families in a downtown um, and, and has received complaints about the unhoused and um, the addicts and the, those that are going in and around the building. Um, they can't leave their, they can't leave, they don't feel safe in leaving their building. It's a, that's a reality. I'm not for sure to code it. It doesn't mean it's a blame, it's not, but it's a reality. What I am also hearing from the business community um, as a property owner, um, cleaning the defecation, cleaning the urination, clearing the, 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 the graffiti that's on, on the wall, um, I will, that part is important to talk about as well, um, and I know that the Mayor and City Council gets both sides, all sides, right? We're doing what we can, we're doing what we can, but we're also having property and business owners that do have the one foot out the door. Um, and, and that is not the end result either. So coming together is really important. We're now going to take these last couple of minutes, and I think that we're going to start with the Mayor and then the Councilor, um, and really talking about where do we go from here. Um, this is, as a couple of you have talked about, this is not the end, it's just the beginning of the conversation. So, Mayor? Again, I want to thank you all for being here. I also want to recognize uh, Susan DeCastro, the City Council President of this year. So thank you, Council, for being here. So, a lot of you have known me for a long time. But I, but I want to be honest about this. Like, when I went to see Sandra, I mean, I mean, Listen, she took a leap of faith with her money to go downtown, right? And Joe Angelo and his wife did downtown, and Chris Charlotte is downtown in Tambo. I mean, there's a lot of folks in the core. We could stay all around the 7th and the 28th precinct, but right now we're talking about the downtown. So we have to come up with a plan, number one, to keep these folks, right? But also, there's no reason to go and have a great coffee if you're going to be sitting there seeing someone go to the bathroom. It's just not going to go, right? So that's why Chief Perez is extremely important. That's why Megan Bridges, our solicitor, is important because we have to come up with um, a plan that's going to accommodate, number one, the humanitarian approach, but also a taxpayer approach. If you're paying taxes, you have an expectation, number one, of a quality of life. And, and it has to happen here in Brockton. And so we can all agree to disagree on certain things, but at the end of the day, we all love Brockton. That's why we're here. And so. The police are ramping up. Um, the conversation we have with the DA today is uh, a lot of times, and I want to thank Derek Salomon and, and Will Schleeman and, and the police department, because we had a great meeting in Mary's office with Chris Cooney, and a lot of things that are happening right now, if they bring in someone right now to district court, the district court clerks are going to say, are they physically, is he or she physically capable to be heard before a judge? Or are they too ill? If they're too ill, and many times they say too ill, they ship them right to good Sam, and then the police have to be there for hours at a time. It's taking police off the streets, but it's, it just doesn't make sense. The system's broken, John, like you said. So I can tell you that um, I'm here to listen with any plans. I also think best practices. I also just want to quell this, this misnomer that Mayor Wu in Boston is shipping everybody to Brockton. It's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's just not true. 
these folks, some of them from Boston, Pine Street Inn, some of them from Quincy, some of them from Haverhill, some of them from Fishburg and Lowell and Lawrence. So I just want to kind of blow that because I keep hearing that, that they're all from Boston, they're not all from Boston. But regardless of where they're from, they're in Brockton right now. So we have to figure out how to help these people, but we also have to make sure that when you drive downtown, and I want to thank Ellie for saying that, I mean, I, I, I live on the west side, I drive to Court Street every day, and then I drive around the city, and I do it all weekend, and I bother all these people over here every weekend, because I take pictures and I call them and I say, this is unacceptable. So we, as a city, have an expectation for excellence, right? We're the city champion. But right now, what we need to do is we need to figure out and leverage the experience of the health clinicians, the substance abuse experts, clergy, and ultimately, if you see something, say something. And I want to appreciate Jed. I mean, I, we have a lot of friends in common, Mike Flaherty and, and the like in Boston. <clears throat> if C-Click Fix is broken and I'm the mayor right now, I have to make sure, I have a duty to make sure the thing gets fixed. And passing the buck is not acceptable under my administration. So we'll have another meeting tomorrow, department heads, to figure out what's going on. But I also want to thank Jeff, the city council, because in the past there's been this fracture. City council here, mayor here, school committee. We're not doing that now. We're all working together, and we have to continue to work get together, or Brockton will not continue to go on the right trajectory. Before you pass, can you talk about the census? The, the, um, the census of Brockton and the students that turned One thing I am going to say, because I'm going to pledge right now, and I'm going to humbly ask all of you to join me. You know what the point in time count is? Because I didn't know until they came there. In January, across the country, Across the country, every city and town goes out and you count the homeless population. And I did it last January. We need more people to do that. We need to do it in a better way. But there's a census number, and I'm going to let Jasmine talk about this because we've looked at tiny houses, we've looked at everything that's going to maybe help Brockton. Currently, we are working on creating a census of our population and our unhoused. This will allow us to get demographic information, total numbers of people, get an idea of what medical, mental health, and substance use issues we're going to be seeing, and also let us know what gaps in services we currently have. It also allows us to complete wellness checks, be able to make sure people are safe. As we go through the winter or if people move their campsites, it will allow us to realize what people are missing, uh, what people we need to check in on more regularly, It'll allow us to just make sure that no one is slipping through the cracks and that people aren't being forgotten as we go through the process of seeing, you know, what agencies are able to best serve each individual person. Um, the point in time count, uh, when I was at Father Bill's, I did help with that process. I continue to help with that process. We go out and we do a similar process where we count anyone that's still outside on that specific evening. It gets added to the total number of people in shelters hospitals and other programs that report being homeless. The number is usually lower than it actually is, so it's not entirely accurate, but it gives us an idea of, like I said, what services still need to be implemented in the different cities and towns in Massachusetts. Um, but these are things that we're going to be continuing to do going forward, and we're looking into other options with our law department as far as humane ways to address some of the issues we're having so that we're keeping things clean and people are safe and getting the services they need. But they're also being held accountable if they're doing things that are illegal or putting people in harm's way. Um, there has to be a middle ground. And I have business cards that are available here tonight if anyone ever wants to reach out and talk to me about ideas they have. I can share the information for our homeless task force with anyone that's interested in attending. We do different presentations about some of them. We talk about the things that we're seeing, and people just get a chance to kind of get a better idea of exactly what all of our agencies do and how we partner. Um, and I'd love to talk to more people about that. There's people here tonight that I can honestly say I wouldn't have heard from otherwise. So please don't be a stranger. Make sure that you reach out to our office. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, again, uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, this is a great conversation. And uh, honestly, the more I listen to people I've experienced in this area, the more I feel hopeful about the future and about our ability to uh, get our hands around the situation and um, you know try, try to mitigate the problems that we have downtown. Just turn the needle, right? If we can just make a one, two, three degree turn uh, to the right, I think that will uh, compound itself into a better, better outcome. So 
Uh, again, everybody, uh, we appreciate your time here. Uh, we talk about resources. You know, what I, I think you know the conversation has to lead to an action plan. What can we do in the short time to try to turn the ship uh, to the right? And some of those things that we've been discussing, potentially a downtown bathroom or something that, you know, we have, we have issues uh, regarding, uh, you know, feces and urine and all of that, people exposing themselves. Maybe if there's a downtown bathroom uh, or two, and, it, you know, not something super expensive, I know we're looking into that, but maybe that's a short-term fix to uh, allow people the dignity to go to the bathroom uh, without exposing themselves and putting a burden on our businesses of having people come in and ask to use their bathroom. So, uh, additionally, uh, joining the conversation about the MBTA and declaring uh, our bridges as private property, I, I think that could help um, clean out uh, our bridges. I don't think there's, uh, you know, there's, uh, our bridges are, I say, the most um, painfully obvious uh, uh, aspect of this problem. Um, the, the congregation down to the uh, bridges and uh, the recent violence that we've had uh, under our bridges is scaring people, and rightfully so. And so I think we need to uh, focus on the, on what we can do. And if uh, the MBTA allows us to turn this into a protocol, declares it private property, then we'll have more uh, you know more authority uh, to clear out our bridges. So I think that's something that we as a city, both um, you know, in our state delegation, really have to lock down and uh, find a path forward there. If we can, I know uh, Pat, we're having trouble with you know uh, our refuse and, and, and our manning of refuse, but you know if we could somehow provide additional resources uh, to to clean uh, downtown, I think that would go a long way just to kind of change the perception of, of downtown. And so we need to put, I think, uh, try to hire additional uh, cleaning services downtown. I think Chief, you mentioned the roadway ordinance. Uh, that's something that I sponsored. And uh, I believe we'll be heard in front of the ordinance committee next week. I, I ask everybody, um, you know, tune into that conversation and follow uh, the our, our progress on trying to develop a, a roadway ordinance that would um, uh, essentially uh, make it unlawful to have somebody come into the middle of the roadway, um, you know, whether it's panhandling or just being careless and not using the uh, pedestrian accesses. Uh, that we have throughout the city. So um, hopefully that, that could go uh, a long way to addressing that issue. One of the things we could talk about is um, you know the creation of more affordable housing. Uh, Brockton, I believe, is carrying more than its uh, load uh, in the development of affordable housing uh, downtown. I think uh, other communities in the area have to step up and also create more housing. This is a supply and demand issue and uh, we're woefully short in supply. And so I, uh, Brockton's gonna continue to build housing to try to uh, alleviate the stress that we have on our uh, housing issue. But we can't be the only population doing that or the only city doing that. We have to have uh, more cities and towns invested in creating uh, additional affordable housing. Um, I think maybe we can look at programs. Uh, and I know, uh, uh, Pastor Roberto, uh, you, you are operating a program that uh, provides work uh, for our, our homeless population, our mentally ill population. I, don't, I, I believe there's nothing that um, helps a person feel better about themselves than the dignity of work. And so we could create programs and maybe uh, provide work uh, for those who have the ability to do so that can put them on a pathway to, uh, to, to mental health. And, um, you know, and, and hopefully that will compound itself and uh, you know, they, they would be in a much better position. So, um, some, some ideas, um, I'm willing always to listen to more ideas, but like I said, uh, the continuing having this conversation, uh, I really feel um, better about our future. I believe that everybody in this room is a professional. Uh, they care deeply about the city of Rockton, and if we do work together, uh, we will start you know, uh, changing the momentum and changing the dynamic downtown and then hopefully that will just keep building and building until we find ourselves in a much, much better situation. So again, thank you all for being here tonight. I'm not quite sure if anyone thought that we were ever going to end at 7.30 and ahead of schedule. Um, I, I think what's really important is that the conversations began. This could have been really, truly um, conversations that takes weeks and these take weeks. Um, the human um, lives, the, the work that public servants are doing, the business community that is continuing to stay here and look for ways to work with the city to stay here. 
Um, I had provided in, for some of you there, we will have all of this on the DBA's website along with the recording. Um, it's called how to get engaged with your community. It can't sit on the sidelines. You just can't. Cindy, what you said, right? You took a risk on the city and you're here. I'm a girl from Chicopee. We never thought that. But I'm a girl from Chicopee that I'm here and I'm not, le I'm not leaving. Um, but we need more of all of you to come step up. And the fact that you're here today in person and online. But there's also about transit-oriented development. There was a beautiful article in the Enterprise about um, the corner of the Center Street. Um, the residents, right? There's more residents that are here. People are investing like Ted Carmen and others. I know Jason Cork was on the, um, the, the, the Zoom um, as well. But it's also talking about a thousand. There was an article from earlier in the year about over a thousand students in the Brockton Public School System are home. Um, if that doesn't stop you in your track, you know, when I, just before the meeting, I had to do a quick walk with my daughter's dog, and I am freezing out there. I am freezing out there. I am freezing out there. I have resources, and I am privileged. Think just for a second about that. So let's work with the businesses that are here. Um, you know, the um, you know, mass drops, you know, 76,000 residents from subsidized insurance, right? I don't know. I mean, there's all of these articles, and every, all you have to do is like, what do we do? This is a start. Um, we'll look forward. I, I, you know, the next steps, what do we expect? This is always before you walk away. Conversations will still happen. Please sign that sign in sheet. That is a way of communicating with all of us. Um, John, yes, you do. We prepped you up for doing that. But please sign that sign-in sheet. We'll have that newsletter. We'll stay informed. Um, whatever information that is shared with me, um, by the way, the mayor's office, um, the counselor, um, the state legislator, um, we will share that. I, I, we're a conduit for, for doing that, particularly for the residents that continue to be here. So I now made this officially past 7.30. I thank all of you and all of you online, um, and have a good evening.